I'm going to uh, get into something tonight that I think, yeah, I don't know how much time we'll get. You know, we don't, we had 20, about 25 or 26 minutes of actual program time. So it doesn't leave you a lot of time to get into the depth of these uh, discussions. Um, on the other hand, I'll be telling you a little later how, you know, you can get monthly a VCR tape that covers our, our services live at the church so that, you know, you can get in on the whole thing. But if we have to skim the surface, let's skim the surface, but let's do it anyhow. Christian Village Church is in Forked River, New Jersey, okay? And I'll give you information a little later. One of the dilemmas that I find, and I think one of the things that religion does not seem to be willing to come to grips with is the question of provability. I mean, can you prove God? Can you prove the existence of God? And all of these things that we're all told exist, you know, and that we should have faith in. Uh, but, you know, are they provable? And now, religion seems to have a lot of trouble with science. You know, science talks about evolution. Religion has a lot of problem with it. And yet, to me, if religion is true, then it would seem that it should be provable by science. Because the Bible says that the things unseen are made known by the things that are seen. So the Bible is saying, yes, nature, the universe, proves God or you know, our religious beliefs. And if that's the case, then why not consider that? Why not consider it? The answer lies in the secret doctrine of uh, the ancient Hebrews called Kabbalah. I can spell it in various ways. I'll spell it K-A-B-A-L-L-A-H for the sake of... Is that coming out all right, Frank? Can you see that? Yeah. Kabbalah, okay. The Kabbalah teaches that God is an ever-pervading energy that fills the universe. Now that is not acceptable to a lot of people because they want God to have a sense of humor, they want God to have compassion, they want God to be a man somewhere. So we set God up as an individual. Okay. God, however, according to the beliefs of the ancients, is the source from which all things come. In his ultimate manifestation, even according to the Bible, God is what? Light. L-I-G-H-T. God is light. That's a very interesting thing when you consider what we taught several weeks ago that uh, Dr. Wilson uh, in Washington State said that the pineal gland of the brain secretes melatonin which can destroy cancer cells. And of course in meditation you stimulate the pineal gland of the brain and according to Jesus if your eye be single your body will fill with light. Well then there we have a, an actual confirmation. Science says that melatonin is a, a, a lightener, and Jesus says your body fills with light, and this stuff destroys cancer cells, then couldn't we say, indeed, God is light and God heals? Because melatonin destroys cancer cells and restores the immune system, according to the um, reports that are filling the newspapers in these days uh, from science. Now, in Genesis 1-3, God says what? Let there be light. And if we are to look and believe as the ancients believed, he's referring to this manifestation. In other words, it could be changed in the vernacular in which we talk, let there be God. Let there be a manifestation within you of this power, of this energy, manifesting in the physical universe. And of course, if God is light, and Genesis says God is light, then religion, and Christianity in particular, has to have a lot of problem with the fact that they are cautioning people against meditating in a higher consciousness, which is New Age, which we are, because in the higher consciousness, according to Jesus, if, you, if your eye be single, if you stimulate the pineal gland in meditation, your body fills with light, or what? Your body fills with God, because God is light. See, so that's interesting where the mainline religions, excuse me, caution people, what was that? Caution people against meditation but at the same time saying to people, oh, you want to walk in the light, but don't meditate. Yet Jesus says, in order to fill yourself with light, you must meditate. How many of you ever heard of this? And I know if you're into physiology and in college, you heard of it. It's called, I'll have to get it spelled right, P-L-A-N-C-K-S, Planck's Quantum T-U-M Theory. Okay? Planck's Quantum Theory. Interestingly enough, 
Planck's quantum theory should be able, and it is able, to prove the existence of God. Okay? Because what Planck's quantum theory says is that light is transmitted in whole pieces in a quanta of action known as, and we're going to have to go over here again, photons. Photons. And of course, from which the word photography and all of that stuff comes. Okay? Photons are non-physical, yet they are the basis for the physical world. You ought to write that down sometime. And you can ask. You can ask a science teacher. You can look in books. You can look this stuff up. What I'm about to tell you is true. Photons are non-physical, yet they form the basis for the physical world. So what is a photon? A photon is non-physical light that creates the physical world. Again, a photon is non-physical light that creates the physical world. Now, in 1 John 1, 5, it says God is light. And in John 1, 18, it says no man has seen God at any time. So let's take a look at that. First of all, we have God is what? God is light. Okay? Qualifies as a photon. And no one has ever seen him. He's invisible. Invisible light, that's a photon, okay? We'll put it out here. And God, or the energy which we can try to understand as God, qualifies to fill the bill there. Invisible light photon, okay? Now, if this invisible light is the basis for the physical world, and that's what Planck's quantum theory says, then maybe we're starting to get a little bit closer to the understanding of what this thing we call God may be. Now, let, let's come back here a minute. We have a photon, we have light, we have invisible light, but it's a creator because it is, you know, responsible for the creation of the physical world. Then we can look at John 1.3. And John 1, 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. A photon. Photon is the invisible light that creates the physical world. We're getting into even, you know, beyond my head, but, you know, we can skim it and talk about it. It's not going to get us in any trouble to discuss it, right? Because there's so much beyond what we know, and yet we try to talk about God and spirit and all of these things, and yet we don't really understand the makeup of our universe, ourselves, at all. Well, let, okay, let, let, let's see what we've said. We said that a photon is light, it's invisible, and it creates, and we tried to compare that with the Bible description of God. God is light, God is invisible, no one has ever seen him, and he may, he's made everything. So that certainly lines up with what we want to call, if we want to call a photon. So then if we say, for just now, just for discussion's sake, don't get all freaked out about your religious and all of this, but let's just say that God is photon, invisible light that creates the physical. What about purpose? What about person? Let's put that down there. You know, personality and purpose. We've got we to gotta come up with that because here we have basically something of a photon that's light, it's invisible, and it creates the physical world, but yet it, it's, it's impersonal. That's no personality. And, and what is its purpose? Well, the photon, or unit of light, according to science, is motivated by definite purpose. That's interesting. The photon is motivated by definite purpose. And, and that, that startling fact was, and I, you're probably going to want me to write this down. I'll put this word down. A scientist by the name of Leibitz, L. E-I-B-I-T-Z came up with that fact, not Leibniz, L-I-E-B-I-N-T-Z, okay, Leibniz, he found that photons that form a ray of light always select a path through the atmosphere that will take them quickly to their destination. And in studying with Planck, Planck's quantum theory said photons behave like intelligent human beings. Okay. Now, hey, is it? Look, let's 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 just talk about it. Photon, invisible light that create the physical, and they behave like intelligent human beings. So then, if we wanted to say, well, could God be a photon? Well, then we say, well, then God is light according to the Bible. God is invisible according to the Bible. 
God is the creator, in, according to the Bible. God is wisdom, person, and purpose, according to science and according to the Bible. Why not? God is photon. So if that's the case, then what do we have here? We have physics proving that there is a definite purpose behind the causes of the material world. In other words, the scientists are telling us that the material world exists out of photons, which is this light, and that they are created out of photons, and there is a definite purpose behind the behavior of a photon. So, so science is in agreement, then, that inasmuch as photons have a definite purpose, have an intelligence, they are invisible light, and so forth. So, but see, that is what was known to the people of the Kabbalah, the people of Krishna, long before there were scientists to talk about photons. See, that's why the Bible says, God is light. Nobody has ever seen God. Without him, nothing was made that was made. He is intelligent. He is wisdom. Well, the scientists will sit down and say, okay, that's a photon. What then can we say is light? Light cannot really be seen. It simply makes seeing possible. Okay? Light, you can't see light, but light makes it possible for you to see. You can't see God, but God makes it possible for you to see. Do you, do you see? Okay. So if you then listen to this, you begin to realize that there really is a natural reality of this intelligence which we call God, which is light, which is invisible, which creates and is intelligent. Pure energy, timeless, spaceless, pervading the whole universe in purpose and action. And what science has attributed to light, the Bible has attributed to God, and the Bible calls God light. And Jesus said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. And so, if photons, light, invisible, which create, have a purpose, okay, if, if that's true, and if 1 John 1, 5 says God is light, then science has proved the existence of God, without a doubt, without any question whatsoever. An intelligence which creates is invisible and is light. Totally lines up in agreement with the Bible. Scientific, scientists would have to say, absolutely, if you want to call God photon, we agree. Intelligence that creates is invisible and is light. So what we have just done is to use science as logic to prove mystical insight or intuition. Do you see what I'm saying to you? In other words, it's the same way in which Dr. Wilson has said that the pineal gland of the brain secretes melatonin, which heals cancer cells, or destroys cancer cells, and strengthens the immune system. Jesus said, if your eye be single, pineal gland, your body will fill with light, melatonin, which is a lightener, and physician, heal yourself. There we have, then, logic of Dr. Wilson and the science from the laboratories proving intuition, Jesus Christ, and spirit from the Bible. In the same way, then, as science here, photons, invisible light that creates, proves that which is God is light and he is the creator of all things. So you see how important both things are and why religion comes up so short, because intuition is mystical insight. That reveals the light that creates Logic, which is science, validates or proves intuition to be correct. Good? Not bad, not bad. In other words, science can prove to the analytical mind what's going on in the mystical mind. That's why it's so exciting in this new age to see all the changes happening and see all the scientific advancements that are proving these things. Religion uses the Bible and their beliefs and unfortunately refutes science and that's wrong. If we use logic, science, to work with the mystical knowledge, then we bring forth that which they call the cosmic Christ. Okay. Instead of going against science, we are one with science. And instead of going against nature, we are one with nature. When I tell uh, many of born-again Christians, I'll talk to them, say, well, I use crystals, and say, oh, they say, you worship the creation. I don't worship the creation. I use crystals. I meditate with crystals. I mean, don't you use penicillin? That's mold. It doesn't mean you worship it. Let me pause for a minute to tell you that, as I said, we, we get into this a lot deeper when we uh, do our services from the church. And at the end of the program, you may want to call 
and you can have and get on our TV network in which every month we send you a VCR tape and it doesn't cost anything and all you have to promise to do is mail it on to the next person. It doesn't cost you anything. Just mail it to the next person and you'll see the services from our church and doing this in, a, in front of a live audience is, is quite a kick and I think you'll enjoy seeing it. So here's the number and you can call on the answering machine uh, 609-971-0537. Seven. And the answering machine will answer. And if you want to be on the TV network, then you say, you give us your name, your address, and your telephone number, because we need the telephone number in case we have to trace tapes later on, okay? That's the number you might want to write that down and, and get in touch with us a little later in the program. So here we found out something this evening, that the Kabbalah is very important to science because the Kabbalah has a system that is both scientific and mystical. That's why it's, that's cosmic. See, and that's I'm a great believer that science proves God if religion will not stick to its old superstitious ways and begin to understand God and what God really is. And, and the Kabbalah actually uses what is called the tree of life. And the Bible promises this wisdom to solve the, the question of disease and life itself. If you'll overcome the lower tradition, if you'll overcome the lower ego, if you'll overcome religion, then you move into the freedom of being able to embrace these things. But as long as you're hooked up with a religion, uh, you've got to do what they say, you've got to believe what they believe, and so forth. And even if it's cuckoo, which most of it is, you have to believe it because after all, you're a member. But in Revelation 2.7, it says, to him that overcomes, I will give you to eat the tree of life. In other words, you'll have proof. You don't have to have faith. In Hebrews 6, 1, the Apostle Paul says that you should get away from having faith in God. Yes, he does. He really does. Hebrews 6, 1, read it. Get away from that. Why? Because you have proof. You, you, you'll understand. You'll be one with God. You don't need to have faith in God once you're one with him. And you do that when you elevate your consciousness in, in, um, in, in uh, meditation. See, Anstel said logic is everything and in everything has an opposite. Positive, a negative, truth has false, good has evil. For instance, if you say, well, you know, this is good and this is wonderful and this is evil and this is horrible. That's what basically religion says. Good is good, evil is evil, and you don't want to get involved with evil, you want to have good. But the Kabbalah operates in a different, the, the opposites are different. They're harmonious balance. In other words, light and darkness. Light for work, darkness for sleep. The darkness is negative, the light is positive, but they complement each other. Up and down, positive and neg negative, they complement one another. You can't, have a, you can't have electrical energy unless you have positive and negative. It's not that one is bad and the other is good, it's that they're, they're both the same line, but they're opposite ends, and you can't have one end without the other. So that, then, is the act of creation. That's the act of, of God, as the Kabbalah knows it. Aristotle logic contrasted tremendously with Plato logic. Plato conceived creation as the Kabbalah. Listen to what P Plato said. Plato said, God, all perfect ruler of spirit, beheld non-being, as it was called later, matter. He found it lifeless and chaotic. He desired all to be good. He looked at spiritual ideas and framed a material world. He created lesser gods, Olympian deities, Zeus, Apollo, the beasts, birds, fishes, and he bestowed on each an appropriate soul. And last, he poured what was left of matter into the cup which he had mixed, the world soul, and from this mixture of soul and matter created human souls. There, Plato described the fundamental unity of everything, animals, trees, the seas, the universe, the stars, you and me. Aristotle logic was completely opposed. It's like religion. Aristotle and religion say, God is there, you are here. Plato said, you and God are here. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. And so Jesus lined up with Plato, who was a mystic. The Kambala that reconciles contraries that opposites unite for the purpose of manifestation. Okay. So Kabbalah then is intuition logic, a harmonious union of science and spirit. And, and that is 
probably the most magnificent thing of the new age that people begin to understand that God is not separate from science. God is one with science. And the, and the Bible supports this. John 1, 14, and the Word, which is the Spirit, was made flesh, science, and dwelt amongst us. Say. In other words, the mystical became scientific. That which is unseen, light, manifest into that which is seen. So you have a union of mysticism or spirit and flesh or God and science. A scientific writer whose name was Ospensky wrote Tertium Organum, and this is what it says. We shall grasp the separate ideas concerning the spirit world in which we really live. The application of this instrument of thought gives the key to the mysteries of nature, to the world as it is. And, and, and there, indeed, is the beauty of all of this, that we start to look at nature and, and start to reason why things happen. Why does a, uh, uh, a caterpillar change into a butterfly? Not that it does. Why does it? What was the, the thought behind it? What was the creative process behind it? Why do the trees renew themselves? Why, why did the life of Jesus Christ duplicate the life of the sun in the heavens? I mean, Jesus comes down from heaven. That's the story. He's crucified. The sun comes down from the constellation Aries and it passes through the Southern Cross, which is crucified on December the 21st. Okay. Jesus is three days and three nights in the tomb. The sun is three days and three nights in the bowels of the earth at the winter solstice. Jesus is born on December the 25th. The sun, by the trajectory of the earth, begins its journey upward on December the 25th. That's the birthday of, of the Son of God, the light of the world. It always has been since the beginning of time. And then Jesus uh, is born of a virgin, and the sun exits out of the constellation Virgo. It's born of a virgin. And then Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And then the sun in the northern hemisphere sits at the eastern sky or the right side. And what happens? Summer comes. Summer cannot come unless the sun is crucified on the southern cross, sits in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights, is born December the 25th of a virgin, and then sits at the right hand of the Father. Unless that happens, there can be no summer. And all of that is mysticism made into scientific fact because you can watch it. In the same way, here in the solar plexus of the body, it's very scientific. You have the central nervous system, which is the solar plexus, which comes together, the sympathetic nervous system, 12 aspects of the sympathetic nervous system congregated the solar plexus. That's the son of man surrounded by the 12 signs of the zodiac, the son of man surrounded by the 12 disciples. And by meditation, and only by meditation, the energy raises that sun up to the higher place where it sits at the right hemisphere of the brain. And then what happens? In the same thing that happens outside, summer comes to your life. All that has been dead and dormant springs back to life. And you are renewed and you are refreshed and color comes back into your life where there has been the drabness and the grayness and the, and the lack of hope. That means simply this, the mystical aspects of God are manifest in the scientific reality of you. God then is provable, not something that you look to find some man sitting up on a cloud somewhere. God is a provable entity of life, a scientific fact, okay? And so that's, uh, and that's an interesting way, and I think we, we touched on some things, and I hope that you found it to be interesting, and uh, I, I enjoy sharing these things. It's just amazing to me that so many people who cannot get outside of the Bible find these things spooky. I don't know why, why you should find nature spooky or an, an understanding that God created these things and we are one with it. Uh, but they do. But of course, that's Dark Ages mentality and much of Christianity, I guess all of Christianity as we know it now, was produced in the Dark Ages of Europe when people were not allowed to think. And today it's exactly the same. They are still not allowed to think unless they think in agreement with whatever church they go to. Well, the Christian Village Church is a New Age church located at 134 Route 9, Forked River, New Jersey. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really do appreciate you watching um, Bill um, on, the, on the TV and that you are of like mind and that you're